um, to start our endocrine uh, grand rounds uh, for this uh, week. And before I start, I just wanted to say two things. One is that we have some issues with us not being able to hear uh, people from who are on the online. So just uh, if you have any questions, just enter it in the chat so uh, we can see that. Also, I would like to um, express our gratitude to Kelly, uh, Kelly Galliet. Um, today is Administrative Professionals Day, and she's our administrator who works behind the scenes to make all of our um, grand rounds and everything happen. Uh, so we want to thank her for her work in this field. <laughs> so, you know, so I wanted to mention that today. So today we are uh, happy to have um, uh, Helen Collins um, uh, come to us uh, from the um, Cardiometabolic Science Institute, the Enveron, Enveron Institute, um, to talk to us on mechanisms contributing to pregnancy-induced uh, cardiac growth and reversal of it. Um, Dr. Collins um, did her undergraduate and graduate and uh, doctoral studies from England, the University of Leicester, and then she was at the University of Alabama in Birmingham as a postdoc and came to the University of Louisville uh, in 2019. Uh, she has been with the Enveron Institute since then in the Department of Medicine Division of uh, Environmental Medicine. Uh, she has um, done extremely well, uh, both when she was in England and also here. Um, she, has, um, she has been a PI on an R01 and a co-investigator in several other uh, R01 grants. Uh, she also has uh, additional funding through the Jewish Fund for Excellence. Uh, she has been very active um, uh, in the uh, field of um, um, at the American Heart Association and the Physiological Society. Uh, she has chaired many sessions. In fact, she just came back from chairing a session uh, uh, in uh, at Long Beach. Uh, she has won numerous awards um, and she just told me that she was awarded uh, the um, Outstanding Young Investigator Award uh, 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 just last week um, at the American Physiological Society uh, meeting. Uh, she has uh, published extensively and uh, has been a very uh, promising uh, new addition to our uh, institution, and we are very glad to have her speak on this topic um, and update us on all her research that she has been doing. Uh, Welcome. Thank you for that kind introduction. So um, as was mentioned, I'll speak to you today about studies that we have in the lab um, looking at mechanisms contributing to pregnancy induced cardiac growth and its reversal. And other than these listed disclosures, I have no additional disclosures. So um, because it's a new year, um, of grand rounds. I, uh, there'll be new people in the audience, so I just want to refresh people of what my laboratory does and its overall mission. So the mission of my lab is to understand the mechanisms contributing to female cardiovascular health and resilience. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, I'll speak to you today about those interests focused on pregnancy-induced cardiac growth and reversal, but we also have several other avenues of investigation in our lab that we're interested in, such as uh, sex-dependent regulation of cardiac metabolism and its impact in post-infarction remodeling, and eventually um, with some addition, the additional completion of uh, some ongoing studies that we have now, um, hopefully these will um, position us well to then look at uh, the pathophysiological and etiological mechanisms that contribute to pregnancy-associated cardiovascular diseases, such as peripartum cardiomyopathy. But as I mentioned, today I'll focus on the studies uh, focused on pregnancy-induced cardiac growth and reversal. So if you leave my presentation today, um, please leave with just one uh, key point um, which is pregnancy in the United States is especially dangerous. So uh, of the of the 
world, the United States, uh, in comparison to the rest of the developed and developing world, has one of the highest rates of maternal mortality. And this uh, image here shows you the specific maternal deaths per 100,000 live births in the year of 2018. And you see that uh, the US has 17.4 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births, which is significantly higher than that of um, the other listed uh, countries in this uh, diagram. And more recently, as of 2020, this uh, increase this uh, rate of mortality was further increased to 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births. So uh, turning our focus to the uh, 50 states in America, you'll notice that many of them have um, this intense or highly intense pinkish purple colors here, which reflect significantly high maternal mortality rates. And you'll notice that many of these um, high levels of maternal mortality seem to be concentrated in the southernmost uh, states of America. And uh, being in Kentucky, I'd be remiss not to uh, focus um, or bring your attention to the specific maternal mortality rates in the state. Um, this was data from uh, 2005 to 2014, which showed that there was 13.5 uh, maternal uh, deaths per 100,000 live births. And so uh, this has been, uh, these uh, maternal mortality rates have been uh, further investigated in a recent document from the Kentucky Department of Public Health. And so this graph here, um, if I re remind you of the initial national average of maternal mortality rates in 2018 from the first slide, which was 17.4 deaths per 100,000 live births, looking at this uh, data set from the Kentucky uh, Department of Public Health, in this same year in Kentucky, the uh, maternal mortality rates were 76 deaths per 100,000 live births. So that's an extremely high rate of maternal mortality in comparison to the national average for that particular year. And in the same um, review by the Department of Public Health, they actually found that many of these deaths were actually preventable. And they found that um, approximately 91% of these maternal deaths in the state of Kentucky were deemed preventable, which was also um, higher than that documented by the national percentage, which was 60% of all maternal mortality in the US was preventable. So this suggests um, that we need to do more to address maternal mortality rates, not only in the United States, in Kentucky, but also um, worldwide. Um, also, uh, studies in the United States suggest that maternal mortality rates differ um, substantially between um, people of different ethnic backgrounds. For example, you'll see in this graph here that uh, in the United States um, in 2015, uh, black non-Hispanic women were three to four more times more likely to have maternal uh, mortality in comparison to white and white non-Hispanic and Hispanic counterparts. So there's a significant racial disparities which also exist with respect to maternal mortality rates. And uh, oh. there we go. And of these uh, maternal mortality rates. Uh, one of the leading and uh, contributing uh, factors to this is the cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of maternal mortality, and it contributes to 15% of all pregnancy-related death in the United States. And um, just so that um, it's usually a common question, so I'll address it right now. Um, cardiomyopathy is seen here, um, and it's not included here in this cardiovascular diseases. And this actually refers to here as pre-existing um, cardiomyopathies, such as dilated and uh, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is um, pri occurring prior to pregnancy. So um, as you'll find from this slide, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death. 
um, in the maternal populations. And uh, of this cardiovascular disease that occurs in pregnancy is comprised of these following um, cardiovascular ailments. So 29% is comprised of arrhythmia, 4% of coronary artery disease, 23% of uh, cardiomyopathy, 24% uh, of pre-existing uh, congenital issues, 16% uh, valvular issues, and there's another 4% which is comprised of other pregnancy-associated cardiovascular issues such as peripartum cardiomyopathy and also uh, preeclampsia and uh, pre-existing hypertension. So it's important to note in the clinical arena that um, pregnancy itself is associated with many cardiovascular changes and therefore uh, the presentation of several uh, cardiovascular symptoms and signs of pregnancy. However, these it's also important to note that these um, signs and symptoms are different from that which is associated with a pregnancy-associated cardiovascular disease. These uh, specific symptoms listed here are those which are normal uh, uh, symptoms which occur during pregnancy. However, um, many of these symptoms are extremely exacerbated or you get more of a pathological stance in terms of these symptoms. And so many maternal cardiovascular risk factors have been proposed. And these include advanced maternal age. Um, in the recent years, many women are choosing to have children later in life, and that is becoming a specific risk factor for the development of maternal cardiovascular disease. In addition, gravidity and parity um, are significant risk factors for maternal cardiovascular disease. As are um, as I come from the Envirome Institute, I'd be remiss not to mention uh, significant factors um, such as smoking um, and environmental exposures, which are significant uh, maternal cardiovascular disease risk factors. Also, as mentioned, the pre-existing hypertension and the development of preeclampsia is, is, poses a significant maternal cardiovascular risk in addition, uh, pre-existing diabetes or gestational diabetes, obesity and poor nutrition are all significant risk factors. Also, uh, surprisingly, um, oh, uh, the, in, at least in the context of uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, even having a C-section um, is a significant risk factor for the development of uh, that particular pregnancy-associated cardiovascular disease. Also, drug use, alcoholism are significant risk factors. Lactation, which is a normal physiological process which occurs um, uh, during the late, late pregnancy and post-birth stages, it also poses a significant risk factor. And this has been um, mostly shown also in the setting of peripartum cardiomyopathy where you get um, the release of prolactin, which is in, which is cleaved to an anti-angiogenic form, which uh, contributes to some of the disease pathology there. And then lastly, infection and autoimmunity have been shown to pose significant risk factors for the development of pregnancy-associated cardiovascular diseases. And so using uh, gestational uh, diabetes as um, a specific example on this slide, it's important to note that there are several environmental risk factors um, which contribute to maternal cardiovascular disease, but also there's several socioeconomic risk factors. And then every individual woman has significant risk factors imposed on them um, as a result. Also, what is important to note is that uh, there are significant uh, short-term and, and long-term uh, complications which can not only impact maternal cardiovascular physiology, but also the long-term cardiometabolic health of the offspring. So um, what we need to do in the uh, general public is to increase awareness among healthcare providers and also the public at the um, sheer um, 
extent of the maternal mortality crisis that we have at present, and to also improve access to healthcare and pre exist and improve um, pre existing uh, prenatal and postnatal care. And then obviously we also need to consider chronic health conditions such as these listed here, um, which will have their own um, significant impacts on the outcomes of pregnancies. And then also, as I mentioned on an earlier slide, we desperately need to tackle the racial and socioeconomic disparities which exist with respect to maternal mortality rates. And then um, what would be beneficial for all women during pregnancy is um, to establish early detection and then timely intervention when it comes to uh, maternal cardiovascular disease. So uh, one way in which this could be done is uh, pregnant women um, uh, should have or um, have access to a multidisciplinary team composed of obstetricians, cardiologists, and other uh, cardio-obstetric and maternal fetal health specialists who can create individualized management plans. And then there is a need for women, um, especially developing cardiovascular disease for uh, during pregnancy, there's a need to uh, develop a panel of effective biomarkers that can be used to detect these at-risk populations of women. And this is especially important because maternal cardiovascular disease has a long-lasting impact. It's been recently shown in JAHA that even the presence of a single cardiovascular complication during pregnancy can increase all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality extensively. And this was shown at not only this uh, age bracket here that I'm presenting of 25 to 35 years at first pregnancy, but this was shown at multiple um, uh, ages, even those of uh, women having children uh, 18 um, or, and also those having them 35 plus. So uh, pregnancy um, and the development of a maternal cardiovascular disease is a significant issue for the long lasting health of the mom. So uh, this, uh, so in order to um, understand the um, effect of these and to fully appreciate the maternal mortality rates and cardiovascular diseases that occur during pregnancy, we first must uh, establish what's occurring in the heart during a normal pregnancy. So it's known that the cardiovascular system changes substantially during pregnancy, where you have increases in cardiac output, mediated through increases in both heart rate and stroke volume. We have increases in blood volume, reductions in total peripheral resistance, uh, changes in blood pressure, and enlargement of the heart. And this enlargement of the heart is a physiological cardiac growth that's known to occur during pregnancy. And that's different from pathological hypertrophy because um, cardiac function is relatively normal. However, in some cases it can be slightly depressed in late pregnancy. However, this is not the case with instances of pathological hypertrophy where you see reductions in cardiac function. Um, the physiological hypertrophy that occurs during pregnancy is reversible, or at least thought to be. Um, and this is unlike instances of pathological hypertrophy, which is relatively irreversible. You also see with pregnancy induced hypertrophy that there's relatively little uh, or normal fetal gene induction and little to none um, in terms of fibrosis and changes um, in capillary density, which is um, the stark opposite with respect to pathological hypertrophy. And although both types of hypertrophy have some similar signaling mechanisms that contribute to both, these actually differ substantially. And so several proposed mechanisms have been uh, thought to contribute to pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. So um, I'd be remiss not to even mention uh, 
hormonal changes. Um, these uh, hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, HCG and prolactin fluctuate um, significantly during pregnancy with um, estrogen levels being higher during earlier pregnancy, progesterone being higher during late pregnancy and prolactin being increased uh, at late pregnancy and uh, post birth stages. And then we see uh, significant mechanical stress on the heart, which can uh, result in the release of growth factors and cytokines, which can participate in uh, pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. And then we have increased uh, cardiac workload through hypervolemia or volume overload that the heart uh, sees, and then the respective increase in cardiac output to uh, meet maternal and fetal demands. And then we have nutritional factors which have been shown in some studies to contribute. However, um, despite these, the specific molecular mechanisms and specifically the metabolic mechanisms that contribute to pregnancy-induced cardiac growth are still not well understood. So we were fortunate enough last year to publish a an atlas of all the significant changes that occur in the heart during all stages of pregnancy and post-birth. And this was basically an integrated analysis of the cardiac transcriptome, proteome, metabolome um, during these time points. And so now I'll speak to you about some of the key findings from this paper. So um, we, we have, um, for the purposes of these uh, studies in this paper you focused on four main time points. We have a non-pregnant diestrous time point. We have a day eight of pregnancy, which we refer to as our mid-pregnant time point. We have a day 16 of pregnancy, which is a late pregnancy time point. And then we have a one week post-birth time point in which the dams um, the FEB dams are allowed to uh, stay with their respective litters and uh, undergo a period of lactation. And so we see that, uh, not surprisingly, during pregnancy, there's an increase in body weight, which peaks at late pregnancy. And this is the point of maximal fetal growth. And we also um, see that there's a significant increases in heart weight and heart weight to tibia length at all stages of pregnancy and post-birth. Um, in line with some of the predetermined characteristics of physiological hypertrophy, we also do not see, as assessed through uh, echocardiography, any specific changes in cardiac ejection fraction, which is a um, marker of cardiac function. But we do see um, which is in line with the uh, change, hemodynamic changes which have been documented. We see an increase in cardiac output, which is mediated in our mice through an increase in stroke volume uh, rather than heart rate. And we also see significant increases in left ventricular and systolic and diastolic um, chamber dimensions. Also in line with the characteristics of physiological hypertrophy that occurs during pregnancy, we also don't see any significant changes in uh, the gene transcripts associated with some of the key members of the fetal gene program, such as MPPPA, MPPBB, and MYH7. In addition, we do not see any um, indications of cardiac fibrosis um, from our uh, serious red stained hearts here. So um, this suggests that we have a model of physiological hypertrophy that's occurring in the maternal heart. But this led us to next wonder what the specific molecular mechanisms contributing to this pregnancy-induced cardiac growth were. So we know that during pregnancy, there are significant changes not only in systemic metabolism, but also cardiac metabolism. Namely, we see um, reductions in glucose catabolism with resultant increases in the catabolism of fatty acids and ketone bodies. And so this, uh, these uh, 
graph panels here are from a study by Zoltana Rainey's lab, and they looked at uh, cardiac growth uh, during late pregnancy, and they found that pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase 4, or PDK4, which is an inhibitor of uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, was significantly increased in late pregnant hearts. And this um, was corroborated also by increases in the phosphorylation of uh, PDH at the same time point. And through various um, additional studies in this paper, they um, found that this increase in PDK4 expression at late pregnancy was primarily driven by increases in the pregnancy hormone progesterone. And the most exciting finding from this particular paper was that when they inhibited PDK4 with dichloroacetate, this um, inhibited cardiac growth, which was suggestive that a reduction in glucose oxidation was uh, an important factor for mediating pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. So we um, next wanted to examine some of the changes in metabolism which occurred in the uh, maternal heart. So we used our four time points and we performed um, bulk metabolomic. Oh, no, wait, sorry. We performed uh, bulk RNA-seq and uh, we, uh, this panel here or this heat map of the top 75 uh, change transcripts, uh, basically this shows not only are there significant changes in going from non-pregnant to mid-pregnant, mid-pregnant to late-pregnant and late-pregnant to post-birth, but um, to briefly summarize, we found that during the mid-pregnancy time point, this was associated with increases in transcripts associated with the vascular endothelial cell compartment, but also um, increases in um, transcripts associated with cell proliferation and cell cycle. The late pregnancy time point, we saw significant increases in transcripts associated with metabolism. And in line with the studies from the Arani lab, we also saw that PDK4 expression was significantly increased at late pregnancy. And then turning your attention to the post-birth time point, we also noted here that there were significant increases in transcripts associated with the extracellular matrix and fibroblasts. So we next went on to confirm some of the uh, changes in transcript levels that we observed in our RNA-seq analysis, and we, we were able to corroborate this at the protein level. We see here from these amino blots of uh, PDK4 that PDK4 expression seems to peak at late pregnancy, which is similar to that of which we saw with the transcript expression. And we also saw that the phosphorylation of uh, phosphofructokinase 2 um, is significantly decreased at late pregnancy time point. So um, collectively, these two pieces of data suggest um, a reduction in glucose uh, catabolism um, at late pregnancy, which is the point at which we see maximal cardiac growth. In addition, the uh, RNA-seq analysis um, identified that there were significant increases in the transcript levels for uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase 1 or BDH1 at all stages of pregnancy and post-birth. So we also um, confirmed this at the protein level. And we also found that in line with the transcript levels, uh, BDH1 protein expression was also increased at all uh, stages of pregnancy and post-birth. So this led us to think that if we have a decrease in glucose uh, catabolism at the level of both PFK and PDH, that we may see a redirection of glucose into pathways that are known to be associated with producing the building blocks that facilitate cardiac growth. And um, we believe that whilst glucose is being funneled into these pathways, um, that metabolism um, through ketone bodies and the enzyme BDH1 are uh, maintaining metabolism. So to next uh, try to investigate this in more detail, um, we performed some bulk metabolomics. 
And this is the heat map of the top 75 change metabolites in um, the hearts extracted from our mice of our four main time points. And you'll see from this heat map that you see relatively no change in the metabolite profile from both um, the in going from the non-pregnant to mid-pregnant um, time points. Um, however, we see most of the changes in the metabolites at the time points in which the heart is uh, the most enlarged, which is the late pregnant and post birth time points. So we noticed from the uh, bulk metabolomics that during uh, late pregnancy, there are changes in metabolites associated with amino acid metabolism. Namely, we see um, changes in um, the urea cycle um, uh, amino acids, arginine and proline metabolism. And specifically, we actually see that the most changed metabolite at late pregnancy is homoarginine, which is, um, I believe, 15 fold higher than. All, the, all of the other metabolites, and this is a urea cycle associated metabolite, and I'll touch touch on that in a little bit more uh, with a little bit more information towards the end of the pre, uh, presentation. We also see significant changes in other amino acid metabolites uh, from the gly glycine serine threonine, um, histidine metabolism, methionine, cysteine, SAM and taurine, and tryptophan metabolites. We also see increases uh, in metabolites and changes associated with fatty acid metabolism, namely sphingomyelin and long chain fatty acid metabolites. In moving to our post birth time point, we once again see changes in metabolites associated with amino acid metabolism. Once again, we see changes in the urea cycle, arginine and proline metabolites. We also see sig uh, significant changes in uh, polyamine metabolites, which have also been, at least I think in the pathological setting, um, have been proposed to contribute to um, changes in cardiomyocyte size and remodeling there. So they could play a role in this uh, physiological um, mechanism too. Um, we also see in changes in nucleotide metabolites, pyrimidine metabolism and purine metabolites, and then uh, metabolites associated with glycerophospholipid metabolism. And um, what's interesting, if you remember back to the um, diagram um, showing what we believe to be the mechanism in which glucose is being funneled to pathways associated with the building blocks of cardiac growth. These three uh, specific uh, metabolite pathways are those. So uh, this is supportive of the redirection of glucose towards these pathways to facilitate the growth that we see. So uh, yeah, so we believe uh, that this reduction in glucose oxidation at this level of PFK and PDH is contributing to some of the glucose entering uh, these pathways, such as this nucleotide metabolite metabolism and glycerophospholipid metabolism, to facilitate that cardiac growth. And the, um, whilst we are having a maintained metabolism through BDH1, so um, the metabolomics that we performed with bulk metabolomics. So we next wanted to uh, allude some information uh, perhaps on uh, metabolite flux. So in order to do this, we um, provided our mice from our four main time points, a uh, liquid diet containing C13 labeled glucose for 18 hours. Um, which we have shown is sufficient to label many of the ancillary biosynthetic pathways of glucose metabolism. And in line with our bulk metabolomics, we saw there was increased um, glucose derived carbon incorporation into the key pathways associated with the production of building blocks necessary to facilitate cardiac growth, such as nucleotide. Um, the glycerophospholipid pathway um, through membrane expansion and also amino acid metabolism. 
And we see that many of these um, metabolites are most more enriched in the late pregnant and post-birth time points uh, in which we observe the increases in cardiac growth. So what I've shown so far is that with mid-pregnant, um, with pregnancy, uh, uh, mid-pregnancy specifically, that we see an increase in transcripts associated with uh, vascular endothelial cell compartment, uh, angiogenesis, cell cycle, and cell proliferation. And this time point is associated with increases in transcript and protein expression of uh, BDH1. By late pregnancy, the heart is further enlarged, and this is associated with changes in transcripts associated with metabolism. And we see at the uh, protein level increases in PDK4, reductions in the phosphorylation of P PFK2, and thereby reductions in uh, glucose catabolism, and uh, sustained increases in BDH1 expression. And then by post-birth, we see uh, changes in extracellular matrix transcripts and the beginnings of the reversal of some of the metabolic changes. Namely, we see at this time point that PDK4 um, begins to reduce in expression, but we still see a sustained increase in BDH1 at this time point. And also at both late pregnancy and post-birth time points, we see an increase in the abundance of metabolites associated um, with um, producing the building blocks that facilitate cardiac growth, such as amino acids, glycerophospholipids, nucleotides, and we also see uh, increases in um, ketone body metabolism. So, uh, what is the, the sorry, um, the Pregnancy increases um, circulating levels of ketone bodies. Uh, the two main ketone bodies are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Um, these are produced in the liver, and um, a key enzyme involved in the production is BDH1, which converts acetoacetate to uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate. And then this beta-hydroxybutyrate is used by non-hepatic uh, tissues, uh, namely the heart, but um, can be used by uh, a, a few other organs. And uh, one of the key enzymes involved in ketone body oxidation in non-hepatic uh, tissues is uh, also BDH1, which converts beta-hydroxybutyrate back to acetoacetate. However, despite the fact that it's known that um, there are increases in circulating levels of ketone bodies during pregnancy. The role of ketone body metabolism during pregnancy is largely unknown. Um, there's several key pieces of literature that suggest that ketone body metabolism can contribute to metabolic remodeling in the heart. Um, key studies by Dan Kelly's lab have um, determine this for the use of a cardiomyocyte-specific BDH1 knockout mouse model, in which they found that um, the heart can use uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate as a metabolic stress defense in the pathological setting. But also, um, when you overexpress BDH1 in the heart, this has also been found to have a protective role in uh, reducing uh, oxidative stress and adverse remodeling. And also in studies which involve the knockout of the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier, it's been shown that um, a provision of a ketogenic diet in this scenario uh, reverses uh, the pathology associated with this. So there's several key pieces of evidence that suggest that ketone body metabolism could uh, play a significant role in remodeling. So. Um, I had hoped today to present a little bit of work on my R01, um, but we're having a few issues with some of the uh, models at present. But that the specific R01 that I have right now um, is investigating ketone body metabolism um, and with the overarching hypothesis that ketone bodies regulate pregnancy-induced cardiac growth and that changes in cardiac ketone body oxidation influence myocardial remodeling during and after pregnancy. And um, just briefly, AIM-1, um, we target 
ketone body availability at the level of the liver through the generation of a liver specific BDH1 knockout and to then assess how the heart uh, maternal heart remodels in response to reduced uh, ketone body availability. And then in AIM2, we have a cardiomyocyte specific BDH1 knockout model and we'll also assess how the maternal heart adapts to the lack of uh, ketone body oxidation. And then AIM-3 is looking at the role of ketone body metabolism in general in the reversal of hypertrophy that occurs following birth. So um, hopefully next time um, I'll be able to present on um, some of the key findings that we have from those two um, main models, be it the uh, liver specific and the cardiac specific knockout. But what's important also in terms of what I just mentioned in AIM-3 is the reversal of pregnancy induced uh, cardiac growth and when it may occur. So um, there appears to be, in terms of the literature, um, there's a, um, a lack of um, uh, rigor um, in terms of some of the findings that we have and that's namely due to the fact that a lot of the studies don't necessarily report um, the lactation status of the animals in these studies. So um, we see from this specific study here the um, LV mass, um, this is a non-pregnant uh, rat, this is a pregnant rat, you see this increase uh, in LV mass with pregnancy, and we have a day zero past postpartum time point and a day 14 postpartum time point, and you'll see from this particular data set that by day 14, there's a significant um, reduction or actually, even in the study by day zero, there's a significant reduction in LV mass uh, following pregnancy. In addition, in a mouse model um, where they looked at a non-pregnant, late pregnant and postpartum day seven, they find that the heart size appears to return to a non-pregnant um, size within one week of birth. But in both of these studies, it's unclear whether the dams were allowed to lactate. And um, so this was a topic of investigation for us. So we used our four main time points, non-pregnant, mid-pregnant, late pregnant, and post-birth with lactation. But for the purposes of the studies that I'll discuss right now, we also included another group, which is post-birth um, without lactation. So basically it's a, it's, consistent in time with it, the post-birth group in that they're both seven days post-birth, but with this non-lactation group, or at least reduced lactation group, um, there is a, um, the litter is removed immediately from the dam to uh, facilitate that reduction in lactation. And so we see with these mice, we see this characteristic increase in body weight at, um, that peaks at late pregnancy. Um, but what we see is with when we remove the litter, body weight goes to a um, decreases immediately within seven days to a similar level of that which is seen with the mid-pregnant mice. In terms of heart weight in these particular mice, we see increase in heart weight, which um, increases throughout all stages of pregnancy and post-birth. But we also see that when we remove the litter, in this non-pregnant, uh, in this post-birth non-lactation group, we see a reduction in heart size, at least uh, to comparable levels as the late pregnant group. So it suggests that lactation is having a significant effect on pregnancy-induced cardiac growth. Namely, it seems to be having more of a pro-hypertrophic effect. And so we expanded this study um, out further to not only look at um, the effect of lactation um, over a longer period, but to try to establish at least um, a time course for the reversal of pregnancy-induced hypertrophic growth. Um, so for this, is the study design is a little bit more um, involved. We have our uh, FEB 12-week-old mice, non-pregnant groups, and then we have one week, three weeks, and six weeks, both post-birth groups 
and uh, post-birth non-lactation groups. And we see here that um, at one week uh, post-birth, we have a significant um, uh, difference between the lactating and non-lactating groups in terms of body weight, which seems to um, be resolved uh, by the three week and six weeks time points. But what's important to note is the dotted line on both <laughs> graphs represents the uh, non-pregnant average. So we see that mice are significantly larger, at least at six weeks, in comparison to non-pregnant controls. We also see that heart weight is significantly increased in post birth uh, mice with lactation up to at least uh, three weeks post birth and then the difference then between the two uh, groups because at three weeks we have to wean the letters so then they become almost a comparable group um, we see by six weeks that although the differences between the lactating and non-lactating mice had gone but they are both significant the hearts are both significantly larger than that of non-pregnant um, controls. So this tells us at least by six weeks post-birth in our mouse model, the heart size has not returned to a non-pregnant size. And so um, part of this uh, new, some of the new stuff that we've been doing is to try to establish the nature of maternal uh, cardiac growth that we see. And so we have our five time points again and so what we did was um, do crude um, examination of cardiac fluid content by examining the wet and dry heart weights and we see that um, despite in our wet and dry hearts that we still see a significant group difference um, with respect to late pregnancy and post-birth in terms of cardiac size. And if we look at the fluid content, fluid content does not change between any of our groups. So we're next now examining the, um, because we see um, changes in uh, cardiomyosis, because pregnancy is typically associated with a, uh, a cardiomyocyte uh, increase in length. So we're next looking at uh, changes in cardiomyocyte length to determine whether these uh, changes may be participating in the changes that we see. So uh, this is where we left off with our summary diagram. And now uh, moving forward to six weeks post birth. So we see the um, at least during this period in going from one week to six weeks post-birth with and without lactation, the lactation appears to have a significant effect on the reversal of cardiac, uh, uh, maternal cardiac hypertrophy. Um, this could be mediated through changes in PDK4 and BDH1. We have some preliminary data that suggests that um, at least at the protein expression level, we're seeing significant um, changes in PDK4 and sustained in, uh, increases in BDH1. And it could also involve um, uh, some changes in cardiac atrophic signaling, which we're also looking at. So hopefully um, during the presentation, I've shown that uh, pregnancy-induced cardiac growth involves the coordination of several uh, metabolic pathways. But like with any research product, many unanswered questions remain. So one of those is uh, whether what the specific contribution of ketone bodies and also homoarginine are to pregnancy-induced uh, cardiac uh, remodeling and how they may play a role in PPCM pathology. So in part, we'll answer the contribution of ketone bodies to this through the R01 studies. Um, but as I alluded to in the metabolomics studies, we see a significant increase in cardiac homoarginine levels at late pregnancy. Um, what's interesting to me specifically is that low levels of homoarginine have been associated with adverse cardiovascular risk and um, also have recently been associated with the development of uh, preeclampsia. So it could be a relevant biomarker for the examination especially in uh, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy pathology. So that's something that we're interested in looking at.
And then the extent to which other cell compartments and other tissues may play a role is evident to us that at least we're seeing changes in some um, liver met liver derived metabolites, homo arginines um, and ketone bodies are produced in the liver and they seem to uh, be playing a significant role. And then our RNA-seq data suggests that there's a coordination between different cell compartments at different stages of pregnancy in the heart. So that's something we want to look at in a little bit more detail. And then the full impact of the hormones, the placenta and maternal fetal interactions on pregnancy-induced cardiac remodeling. And then we've started to, as I alluded to in one of the final slides, looking at and trying to determine the nature of the hypertrophy that we see during pregnancy. And then something that we also have um, is that we started to look at is the impact of multiple pregnancy lactation cycles on cardiac growth. And um, I guess I'll, this, I, the spoiler alert on that is that we see that with successive pregnancies, the heart becomes larger and larger. We've gone up to four successive pregnancies. So that's something that we are excited to continue to look at moving forward. So um, I'll just close out the presentation with thanking my faculty mentors for their uh, continued support throughout the years that I've been here and also members of the Hill and Jones Labs and also my own lab, which have helped immensely in producing a lot of the data that I've presented today. The Imaging and Physiology Corps for help with histology and echocardiography. Pao Lokovic from the Mass Spectrometry Corps uh, for help with the uh, stable isotope resolved metabolomics. Uh, also Ju Julia Charaka for, from the Kentucky Imbray Corps for help with the uh, transcriptomics analysis. Uh, other members of the Center for Cardiometabolic Science and the Enviro. My external R01 um, collaborators, uh, Zolt Arani, Peter Crawford, and Dan Kelly, which are all powerhouses in ketone body metabolism and metabolism in general. And then collaborators at the University of Kentucky, which have also recently assisted us in doing a multi-organ pregnancy stabilizer tope resolved metabolomic study, which I'll be able to present um, next time for sure. And then also um, the funding for which this work would not be possible. And so with that, I'd like to thank you, take any questions, direct you to my contact information, and then also bring this up for everyone. Things that come into my head in pregnancy, and then you also have an enlarged heart and a catheter. And I think pregnancy probably has more blood volume involved, although I think after it's also getting increased in blood volume. So, but then the pregnant heart goes back to what it was before the athlete's heart stays the way it was. So, uh, is there no I mean, could ketone bodies have something to do also with the increase in the athlete's heart? They certainly have a lot of ketones from all of this. Yeah, um, so... I, you know, I'm just wondering about any relationship. Yeah, there there's been some studies that I've been involved with um, whilst I've been here with Dr. Brad Hill's lab. So they've been looking at exercise-induced cardiac growth. And we actually see... Um, very comparable data when you specifically look at my late pregnancy time point and the um, exercise adapted heart. So we also, they see increases in ketone bodies and circulation. And then I think they also see increases in BDH1 um, expression as well. Um, so ketone bodies are significant increased in both models. We also see some of the similar changes in the metabolite profile between the exercise heart and the pregnant heart. So I think there are some overlapping things that occur uh, between both types of physiological growth, but I think there's also some other um, distinct um, 
contributing factors to both that make them also different to each other. Um, I think you had mentioned something else um, when you had spoken there. Uh, before you mentioned ketone bodies, there was something else that kind of. Well, you know. um, I was in between that and the ketone yeah. bodies. Now I forget. I apologize. Is volume what drives the whole? What drives the whole? What drives the all of the changes? I mean, how does the adaptation to volume? <sighs> well. I think you have to it has to adapt to the the volume changes um, and then so one what I think there's also it's hard for me to like put my the volume changes are important but there are so many other changes that are occurring during pregnancy um, not only in the heart but systemically that could be driving it there's a lot of growth factors in circulation too um there's the cytokines and everything as well so um i think it's a coordinated uh response because we don't only see that we see cardiac growth but we also see and i hadn't i didn't present it today but we see significant enlargement of many of the other organs too uh during pregnancy so i think probably there's probably something in circulation as well that's driving some of this could be the ketone bodies, it could be something else as well, it could be a combination of factors together. So hopefully as we move forward, we'll be able to like tease apart more things to have like a solid foundation to then really add on some extra things like a comorbidity, like add in diabetes, add in some obesity, and uh, then move on to like some of the disease models too. So I um I also um think uh, the the thing that I couldn't remember came back to me a second ago and then I forgot it again. So I apologize. It's the I'm having a senior moment. Because one of the things is that uh ketone bodies seem to be very important. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know. You're not paying as much attention to it, but in the when you treat people with gestational diabetes mm -hmm. uh, or type one diabetes, we pay a lot of attention not to let the ketone bodies go on. Yeah. Uh, of course, we're talking about levels that are above one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, so yeah. There must be some optimal level. So um so basically um at resting it's usually about 0.5 uh, millimolar and then with um, pregnancy I think there's been values documented between one and five um, and then also uh, with really really intense exercise or starvation it's it can go up to around 10 and then with uh, ketoacidosis it's like 25 so there is like a graded effect but it also there's the effect of um i think with diabetes you also have the increased uh, glucose levels but we see when we have in our at least in our models of physiological growth we have when we have that increase in ketone levels we have a decrease in uh circulating glucose levels so maybe it's in those conditions, it's the glucose and the ketones together, and then you're getting the it's the insulin so resistance and everything. Or, uh, for the SCLT2 inhibitors, mm -hmm. is that they lower and raise the ketone. Yeah, so that's basically what we have in the pregnancy model, and I believe also that's what um, my colleague has seen in the exercise model as well. So, um, but yeah, that's a. Uh, I'm interested to uh, just yeah in, yeah um she said to press escape um let's see um oh yes thanks for a great review of causes of pregnancy induced cardiac growth 
What is the best way to monitor that and reverse it to reduce uh, pregnancy related deaths? So, I guess my major focus at the present time is looking at how the heart adapts to normal pregnancy. So, what is occurring uh, during that time is normal cardiac growth. So, usually that's not under a normal pregnancy is not usually investigated by um, cardiologists or even, for example, ketone bodies. No, they're not really examined in a normal pregnancy. They're only usually examined in gestational diabetes or diabetes or pre-existing diabetes. So in terms of those women which at least are at high risk for developing pregnancy associated cardiovascular disease, um, they should have or do have um, relevant uh, cardiac monitoring. So I think I believe they have um, echocardiograms um, during their pregnancy. They're closely monitored, especially um, those which are at risk of developing peripartum cardiomyopathy. They are um, also advised not to breastfeed because obviously I mentioned in an earlier slide that lactation is a significant risk factor for the development of that particular hypertrophy. So um, I think probably moving forward, most women at risk should be given individualized care plans in uh, their pregnancies to try to at least um, reduce the risk of death. But we also have to do a little bit more of um, uh, tackling some of the risk factors and then obviously tackling the racial and socioeconomic risk factors, which will involve more than just changes in basic science. It will involve some social and structural changes uh, in the healthcare system. Yeah, like a different uh, uh, cut off level for components or something like that in pregnant women because they have big eyes. And you think they would be producing more. I don't know that I've ever read anything about producing that. I mean, they use um, it. Uh, they, 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 some people would like to use it as a markup for people with heart failure and other things that indicating when they're getting into more trouble, but it's quite a spread. But in, in any case, I've never read anything about that in pregnancy. So, in terms of. Don't read the literature on pregnancy. Yeah, in terms of the biomarkers, um, it's tricky with the pregnancy field because some of them, which have been proposed to be biomarkers, actually change during normal pregnancy. So it's tricky if you have something that's already going up and it just goes up a little bit more. If you target, you may target it too much and then bring it down to a, a, a bad level. Um, but um, there's. Um, most, uh, for example, with um, uh, preeclampsia and also peripartum cardiomyopathy, um, the most popular markers there are like SFLT1 and um, also uh, the angiogenic form of uh, anti angiogenic form of prolactin. And then I don't recall seeing anything about troponin as much, but. Um, that may just be me like misremembering right now, but I, do, I don't believe it's commonly used anyway. Uh, but pro BNP has been used in like um, those at, at risk uh, females as a potential biomarker. Has it shown that and uh, so for the BDH one didn't does it just go up more or does it just stay high? It seems to, at the, um, in our studies, it seems to stay high and it stays high as long as the hearts are above that non-pregnant threshold. So um, towards the end of the presentation, I showed you that even by six weeks, um, post-birth hearts are significantly larger than non-pregnant hearts. And by that time point, BDH1 is still up. It hasn't gone down. The only thing that has fluctuated during that whole time course is PDK4. And that's probably more associated with, um, at least during pregnancy, the progesterone increase. Um, 
and then also for some reason it goes it starts to increase in the non-lactating group after birth so we need to look into that a little bit more but yeah what we want to do is follow our mice out for a longer time period to fully establish the reversal um what i had read recently was that there was a study that came out in human uh, uh pregnant women that um that their hearts don't go back to a full non-pregnant like state they stay at like a new normal so that could be what we might see as well um which would be interesting because a lot of the clinic uh basic science um studies they don't use females that have given birth they use virgin females in the uh, preclinical studies so that would um, also push us into another area which i'm interested in in being able to then so look at that bigger, like, fibrosis or is it so we don't uh in our pregnancy model we don't observe any changes in fibrosis and we've done this in the feb mice and also uh, c fetus 7 black 6j mice uh, we don't see any uh, changes there um in normal pregnancy but what we do see and we don't see any changes in uh, fluid content so what we think is um we think because i hadn't shown this data as well so we see gravimetric heart weight increases uh, during pregnancy and post birth, but that's only actually associated with an increase in cardiomyocyte cross sectional area at post birth. So, this would suggest that at post birth it's more concentric, late pregnancy it's more eccentric. So, we're trying to tease apart the hypertrophy that's driving everything. And it could be that this, um, these changes here could underlie some of the driving factors that go towards disease. But um, I don't think, I'm going to put it out there and say, I don't think it's cardiomyocyte proliferation. So it could, it's of, it could be proliferation also of other cell types in the heart that is making it bigger as well. So, but that's uh, studies for another day. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.